I don't know about everybody else, but there has been just an expectancy in my heart the last couple of weeks. Have you, have you guys been sensing that? That God is up to something? I like it when God's up to something. I always know the devil's up to something, and that's why we're supposed to be uh, ever watchful for the things that he does. We're beginning the, the season here shortly, and I'm going to preach my trumpets message this week because by the time we get to our, our next time of meeting, I'm going to be in Pocahontas, Arkansas. So I'm going to give that this morning. And I want to start with Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25. I love the fall feasts because in the fall feasts, the Lord returns. How many know that's a good thing? In the fall feast, the Antichrist, the false prophet get their comeuppance. Satan gets thrown into the abyss for a thousand years. There's just a lot to appreciate with what the fall feasts represent. It also represents the beginning of the millennial reign. I, I, I am waiting as I watch unfolding a prophecy. You know, things may get tough for a little bit, but I've already read the end of the book. I know that we're victorious. Leviticus 23, 23 through 25, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month and the first day of the month shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servantile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You know, now we have been sharing about the feast now since about the mid-1990s. And uh, I have loved being able to share the significance of the feast of the Lord in the life of the believer because we have been disenfranchised from God's truth. We've been disenfranchised from the very things that are, that are supposed to help us understand and get back into the rhythm of the kingdom. I like what one teacher, he said, because the feasts are all embedded within them is God's prophetic clock. And when we were disenfranchised from them, we took the hands off the clock. And now most people, when they point to Bible prophecy, they're pointing to a clock without hands on it, trying to say, boy, it's getting late, isn't it? This is before the digital age. We, if, if you don't have the feast and understand them, you really don't know where we're at. Now, the Feast of, of, uh, the feast of Trumpets... Rav Shaddai Gion shares that there are ten primary remembrances which the shofar is blown on the Feast of Trumpets, and each of these remembrances highlights a unique aspect of this feast. The first is the coronation of kings. That whenever Israel would coronate a king, it would be for the for, it would be during the Feast of Trumpets. Why is that? Why is that so important? Because how many know when the Lord comes back, it's going to be in connection with the Feast of Trumpets, and he is going to be coronated King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not only of heaven but in earth. And he's going to come back, and he's going to take care of some things. It's also a call to repentance. Beginning with the Feast of Trumpets, we have ten days of awe. And I call them ten days of divine realignment. That we need to make sure that everything that we have in our life is right with God and right with one another. I tell you what, it, 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 in the body of Christ, if we do this once a year, how many feuds would have to end in church? I have seen feuds go from generation to generation, and they have gone for so long that nobody even knows what they were even started over. That's not biblical. When we get into the biblical, uh, synchronized with the kingdom, we begin to flow. And as we enter into the feast, if we don't do it by rope, but by do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a uniqueness every year to the feast that God is trying to, to bring us closer to him and get Babylon off of us. And those 10 days are ours. I'm, get, I'm repenting of everything. I don't want to allow Babylon any foothold in my life. It also celebrates the giving of the Torah at Sinai, at Sinai, although it was given at Pentecost. It's this time of year that that cycle is restarted, so they, they celebrate the giving of the Torah. It's also the warning of impending judgment. That's why the ten days of awe. 
I believe as, as much as I study the Word of God, I believe that the rapture is going to happen at the last trump on the Feast of Trumpets, most likely at the end of the book of Revelation, not at the, not at the beginning, which, boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, pre-trib really sounds good. But we right now, what pre-trib has done in its theology, it has prepared a body that can't go through anything and don't think that they have to. Tell that to the Christians in the Middle East today. You see, that, that's a luxury of an American doctrine, of a Western doctrine. It doesn't go in other places. Now, I believe in doing what, what uh, Walter Martin said when, when he was kind of cornered by some of his students on, you know, is it pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? And, and he kind of smiled and said, here's what I do. I pray for pre and prepare for post. I mean, there's wisdom in that because we are looking through a glass darkly. But when the Lord does come back, there's 10 days, and I believe that all those, those seven vials of wrath are going to be poured out in 10 days upon the earth, and each one there's a plea from heaven, you better repent, the king's coming. You better repent, the king is coming. Listen, his wrath is being poured out. You better get it right. You better get it right. You better get it right. And then we get to the Day of Atonement. That's the Valley of Armageddon. And I thought it was funny this week. I, I spoke with a, a guy that went over to, to Israel, and he, he walked the Valley of Armageddon. You know what's in it right now? It's a watermelon patch. <laughs> the entire length of the Valley of Megiddo is a watermelon patch. I mean, no, oh, that's going to dynamically change. He was talking to the guy that owned the, that, owned the, you know, that works in the valley and, and, and his tour guide, and, and he said, uh, you know, there's going to be one of the greatest wars on planet Earth right here. And the guy, no, no, we don't want war. We want watermelons. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but how many know the Bible's true? It also signifies the destruction and the future building of the temple. The rabbis believe it was at this time of the binding of Isaac when Abraham was going to offer up Isaac to heaven. It's also a call that we need to fear God. And somehow or another, we have preached a grace that has eliminated all fear of God. Now, we will fear the world. We fear what other people think, but somehow or another, we don't have to fear God. That needs to be reversed. We don't need to, th- we don't need to worry about what people think. We don't need to worry about what the world thinks. We better start worrying about what heaven thinks. And at this time of the year, with the sounding of the trumpet, that's reminding us that we are to fear God. It's a warning of, the, of judgment coming the day of the Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. It also announces or prepares us for the great in gathering. It's called the tabernacles. When Jesus comes back and he tabernacles among men and establishes a millennial reign, it also reminds us of him raising the dead. How many know at the last trump? Not all the rehearsals. But one day on the Feast of Trumpets, there's going to be that last trump, and when that last trump sounds, all the dead in Christ shall rise. All the saints that have gone on before us are going to rise, and they're going to have glorified bodies that will never hurt again, that never ache again, never age again. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. Other things that it reminds us of, the ten days of all are also connected to the wedding feast. In biblical times, Weddings usually were held on Wednesday because the bride was given three days to prepare for the coming of the bridegroom, and the wedding feast would last for seven days, a total of ten days. So you put that into the fall feast. If we're raptured at the beginning of the, of the Feast of Trumpets, while the whole earth is being warned and the wrath of God is being poured out, we have three days of preparation for the wedding feast, and then we have a seven-day wedding feast, and when it's done, we come back with our king, and we watch him kosher this planet. How I many know the greatest battle that the world will ever see, the greatest, the greatest army that, the, that can ever be amassed, the Antichrist will amass? And I don't think that Steven Spielberg or any of them can actually grasp because we're, we're, we're probably going to have Nephilim. We're going to have, we're going to have a super soldiers. We're, I mean, it, it, you might as well throw in a flying saucer or two. I mean, just everything that you can imagine when you read the book of Revelation could possibly be there to meet God at the Valley of Armageddon, and it lasts for 30 seconds because all our king has to do is speak a word and they're dead. The greatest battle, it almost reminds me of when Saddam Hussein said, the mother of all battles are going to come when America comes, you know, and how short-lived that lived. We'll reduce that to about this long. 
that over 6,000 years the enemy has been planning on that battle, and it's going to be the shortest battle that has ever been waged because they waged it against Almighty God, the God of heaven and earth who comes back as the conquering king. Now, Satan may have seen what God did I remember reading Paradise Lost where you, you have Beelzebub and Lucifer in this crater on the planet, and one turns to the other and says, who knew? You know, we went up against God. He took his finger and flicked us off of, off of heaven. Who knew? But they have never seen him get off a throne and mount a horse and say, okay, now I am a man of war. That's part of what this season's about, understanding that. What's well, also very unique to the ten days of awe, that in Israel it was known as the king is in the field. That the king of Israel would go to the place where common people would be able to sit and talk with him and, and have access to the king to where he could really find out what's going on in the nation. And how I many know when you look at our president and some of those in office today, they don't have a clue of reality. They don't know what reality is. They don't know what the normal person goes through. And it's so easy to do when you're stuck up on a, in, in, in some capital somewhere. But this was a time of the year that the king would come down and he would walk the fields of Israel so that he could see how the people were living and the people could come and talk with him. And so it's also a time of, of talking with God. Now, I've also learned that part of this aspect is there is an open window this time of year to hear prophetically from heaven because the Feast of Trumpets is also about when God speaks. And as I, and, you know, years ago, I, I kind of watched how Lester Summerall did it. Now, he did, would do it at the end of the secular year, but he would set apart the time just to try to hear God. And so I, I begin to try to do that, and I have found that when you begin doing it and you line yourself up with the Feast, it's the prophetic on steroids. That every year God has shown me something and it has proven itself out and, and has moved forward. You know, in Amos 3, 7 and 8, it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? In the complete Jewish Bible, it reads this way, Adonai God does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. You see, God wants us to be able to work with him. God wants us to be able to get in, in synchronicity with heaven. It, God, when God does something, he wants his children to be on board so that they can receive the full benefit of what heaven's going to do. And so this time of year, I always try to just press into God so that I can really hear what he wants, what he wants to do. And so this year as I was, I was praying and, and looking at some things, and, you know, and one, of the, one of the ways that sometimes to get a hint is you kind of look at the Jewish year. How many know 2014, 2015 doesn't mean anything to heaven? It's like everybody said, Jesus is going to come back in year 2000. Remember that? We're going to have Y2K and Jesus come back all at the same time. It is the end of the earth. The year 2000 doesn't mean nothing to God. In fact, his calendar, sometimes you can have 13 months, sometimes you can have 11 months. It depends on the beef barley harvest. This upcoming year that starts on the Feast of Trumpets is 5773. And so you know how you can take apart the Hebrew and look at different things. And so I looked at each number, and it's hey, Zion, Zion, het, which means behold, weapon, weapon, fence. I thought, well, that really don't speak a lot to me right now. Uh, you can also take it 57 and 78. But you can also take it and just add all the numbers together to see if God wants to reveal something to you. And it, it equals 25, and it is cough hay. Cough means an open hand, a covering, and a bent hand, and hay means to behold. And, if, and it fit in perfectly with what God was telling me. We're getting ready to enter a season that God is going to take the body of Christ with both hands. One is going to be a bent hand to cover the other one is going to be an open hand to provide. Selah. Yeah, think about that for a minute. I need that bent hand of cover so that the God can push some of the things back. To you. How many feel like this, like the devil has sometimes it just moved on your front porch and that you're his only project? He's just here to mess up your life, to mess up every opportunity, to steal from you, to make everything a living hell for you. God is saying, I'm getting ready to give you some cover. 
and I'm getting ready to provide because this is what God spoke to me. Yesterday morning, I, I was here in the office, and, and I, in the morning time, my, my, my purpose is to hear from God and to set things in order. Because you know, I had several enrollments and reviews and different things to do. I've got to make sure that, that I'm, I'm setting priorities right because sometimes somebody can call with something that would take me two days to do, but it may have to wait two or three days because this is my kingdom task and my kingdom assignment for today. And I'm sitting here working, and God said this to me. He said, rebuild and expand. And I mean, it's one of those ones where it's so clear, you almost want to turn around to see who's behind you. Rebuild and expand. Why is God saying that? Because right now, the body of Christ is really in a mess. Now, we're starting to catch on to what the devil's doing. We're starting to wake up. We're, waiting, we're waking up on, on what I call our techno-induced zombiehood. How many know that watching TV constantly, especially if you allow yourself to get in the wrong mind, will put you in an in a, in a altered state of consciousness? Just for programming. Next thing you know, you buy stuff you didn't want to buy. You're hungry all the time, even when you weren't hungry before. Anybody, I mean, this, you're sitting there watching TV, and you, the food is the last thing on your mind. And then they bring out this huge burger that never looks like it when you go to the restaurant and buy it. It never looks like that. Somehow or another, it, it gets hit by a shrink ray, you know. But here it is, big and bold, and all of a sudden, you, you, I'm hungry. Come on. God is calling us out of zombiehood. I think with all the zombie movies, what Hollywood is doing is they're making fun of what they've been able to do with America. Techno-induced zombies. God is saying it's time to wake up. It's time to begin rebuilding what the enemy has taken. Repair, rebuild, and then expand because we're going to need to do it before the unfolding of prophecy. That there is a specific window in where we are right now that if we will heed the voice of God and begin working with heaven, that God is going to loose an anointing to repair I mean, no, some of us have had some bodies that have gotten banged up over the years. And there will be an anointing for God to begin to repair. But it's going to take some action on our part. I'm having to learn to eat different things because I can't believe God to repair when I'm constantly eating stuff to destroy my body. I mean, I, I, I have learned, I, I go through the grocery store anymore and sometimes even a health food store. And I can hear this Holy Spirit say, that's not food. That's not even food. There's nothing in that for you. And some of my favorite haunts at the grocery store are now places I never go. I won't. And, that, and now I, t I train myself. That's no longer food. I used to think the perfect meal was a bag of Doritos about this tall and a, and a uh, half-quart tub of dip. Perfect food is perfect for any movie. And now I walk by that stuff and I say, that's not food. And believe it or not, I walk in front of broccoli and I say, that's food. Now, for some of you guys that have known me for a long time, there was a time I wouldn't touch a vegetable. I wouldn't touch it. Now I crave it. Because God is reteaching me. Listen, if I'm going to rebuild you, you've got to start putting the right building blocks in. Why God is saying there's an open, there's an open door in heaven so that God can, we can begin working with God instead of against God. Wouldn't it be better if, the, if God wants to do something in your life and we quit doing things that frustrate his work and begin working with him? I think that's part of what God is saying here. We, we got to get Christians into work mode because whenever a prophetic word is given, now I've been in, in the charismatic movement since 1978. When I went in the military, I kind of went into the charismatic movement. And when, you, when somebody gets a prophetic word from God, two things happen. They get this stupid look on their face, and then they sit down. Oh, good, I don't have to do anything anymore. Do you ever see that anywhere in the Bible? Okay, it's time for war. I go over here. The prophet grabs the shofar and says, let's go get them, boys. 
and everybody gets a stupid look on their face, and they sit down. How many know you're getting ready to be overrun by Babylon? You're getting ready to be overrun by Egypt. You're getting ready to be overrun by Syria. When the prophetic word is given, it's an alarm to work. The opposite of what we have been programmed to do. That's why we can receive a word and nothing happens. Because God is saying, listen, I'm putting wind in your sails. And so we pull up to the dock, we, we drop anchor, we tie it off and get out of the boat. God is calling us absolutely to the opposite of that. God is saying, listen, I want to work with you. And there's three things that we've got to do. We've got to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Then we've got to strengthen our family in the Lord. And then begin rebuilding and expanding our kingdom assignments. All three of those are important. How many know that if you don't begin working on your relationship with God and start getting some things straight to strengthen you, that God can move and he'll leave you behind? Or God can move and leave your family behind. I don't want that. I got I to learn to be like King David. I want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 8. This is when David was out and he was at war and he left his family. And all the men that were with him left their families in what they thought was a safe area in Ziklag. And they come back from battle and they discover that the Amalekites, I believe it was, came through and took their, all their families and took everything they owned captive. The Bible says these men of war, these great men, the, the mighty men of David, they, were, they, were, they got to the place where they cried until they could cry no more. And, and after they got there, they said, you know what, I think we ought to kill David because David is the one who talked us into this. Have anybody ever felt like you've been there? You did exactly what God said, and when you come back, everything that you had was gone. But the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop, and shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. What God is telling us is everything that we have lost in the last season, that was of God. Now, this is not about building up Babylon. This is not about building up your agenda. It's about what God gave you that the enemy stole. It is time for us to go and take it back. But the only way we can do that, David, before he even prayed, he encouraged himself in God. We have got to learn how to encourage ourselves in God. We've got to quit waiting for other people to do it. You've got to learn to do it yourself. What helps encourage you? You know, you can talk yourself into a victory, and you can talk yourself out of a victory. You can talk yourself into a lot of stuff that... We can justify any sin. And let me tell you something, that in the body of Christ needs to stop. Quit justifying, quit making excuses. The season we're at, excuses have got to die. We need to quit making excuses and start talking righteousness. This is what a righteous man does. This is what a righteous woman does. This is, this is how our family is going to act because this is what it says in the word that we're going to do. And we're a people of this book. And this is how we live. And this is how we die, is by this book, not about about what is convenient. We have got to learn to encourage ourselves. We have got to learn to seek the face of God. And when we do, God's going to begin giving you some marching orders. And for some of us, it may be a big transition. For some of us, it may be little, little adjustments here or there of things that we need to do. But now is the time to get it back. This season is the time to get it back. You need to get it back so that you're ready as prophecy begins to unfold. This is a time that we have got to rebuild, that we have got to re-strengthen. How many are watching what's going on right now in the Middle East with, with ISIS or ISIL? They change the name every week. That's pure Islam. Now, they're trying to say, I can't call that Islam. Well, then go back and read their books. That is what Islam is all about. The Quran itself says that Islam it grows or expands by terror. We need to be strengthened. Number two, we're going to have to face our giants just like David did. 
Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 20, or verse 26. See, there was a pivotal point. Everybody was looking at Goliath's size. Now, I've been, the last six months or so, I've been studying Nephilim, or giants. Do you know that uh, they would look at Goliath and call him Pee Wee Herman? He was a short giant. Before the flood, they could have been as tall as over 400 foot. After the flood, 36 feet, the original Malachites, the ones that he was a descendant of. They were as tall as cedar trees, according to the Word of God. By the time you get to Goliath, he's puny. <laughs> Come on. But everybody said, I'm not going to fight that thing. And all of God's people were hiding in holes, and this little shepherd boy came up. He says, what you guys doing? But I want you to listen to these words in 1 Samuel 17, 26. And David spoke unto the men that stood by, saying, What shall be done unto the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the approach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You need to underline who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this one without covenant? It's time that we learn to walk in covenant. There what we have done in covenant, we have so reduced covenant to this very small thing that we're, we're living on our the little hors d'oeuvres, you know, you give before the major meal, little cheese, and, cheese whiz on a cracker. We're living on that, calling that covenant. When God is saying, no, there's an entire banquet of what covenant and kingdom is, go ahead and set down the rich crackers and go ahead and set to the banquet and learn who you are in me. The word says that we are more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. That we have been given authority in his name. Learn the covenant and learn the power and authority in his name. And then you can face any giant in your life and say, who is this thing that has no covenant with God? It doesn't matter how big the enemy is you're facing. What matters is the covenant that you have. And what I noticed about David while Goliath is laughing at him, David ran to the battle. You need to start tagging your giants and saying, you're going down. We don't pretend that they're not there. We don't try to get along with them. We don't try to bring out a peace accord with the giants in our lives. Our job is to stand in our covenant and eradicate them out of our lives forever. We have been petting our giants and pacifying our giants for too long. And the Bible says one of the problems with the giants is they devour the land. How much of the blessing that God has brought into your life or wanted to bring into your life was devoured by the giant that you wouldn't slay? I'm tired of my giant eating up all my stuff and the only way that I can get rid of it is I've got to stand in my covenant and God is requiring me to take its head off. You see, with David, the rock wasn't enough. We don't know if that, if that killed him or knocked him out. But how many know that when David took his own sword, Goliath's sword, and cut his head off, it was, it was, you didn't have to wonder after that, did you? And it so scared the Philistine army that this little shepherd boy with a giant's head in his hand chased the entire army off. You don't know the power of covenant in you when you begin to have faith in it and God begins to release it in you. The greatest power in the universe is God's covenant flowing through his people because it is established by the blood of Jesus. It is established by that name that is above every name. And it is time for us to gain confidence in that. I, have, I am trying with all of my might to train myself to bow my will to the name of Jesus. That any time God says to go left and I want to go right, I bow my will and I make myself go left. Because by doing that, I promote absolute confidence in that name. And if I respect that name, I can make devils respect that name. Because you got to believe. You got to believe. 
We treat the things of God flippantly, but we want hell to respect it when it's convenient for us. If we will respect the name of God and the word of God and the commandments of God and the blood of Jesus when it is not convenient for us, then that name will be enforced when we use it when it's not convenient for the devil. We've got to even do more than that. God is, there's just so much God's trying to show me, I'm, I'm trying to bring, bring into this because we ha- God is wanting to work with us. It's, I got this hand here and I've got this hand here, but you've got to take out of this hand and start building and doing your battle. God's not going to do it for us. The only thing God did for you was salvation because after that he wanted to be God and sons working in the earth, God and daughters working in the earth. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 13. Verses 17 through 19. I think so many believers, because they have a half-hearted response to what God is doing, they, they, they sabotage their own victories. And I am tired of making it easy on the devil. My job in the earth is to absolutely make this planet a living hell for him. I want to get it to the place that when the rapture does happen, the devil is in a sense relieved that he doesn't have to mess with me anymore. Now, I, I kind of want to set this, the stage here for this as we get into 2 Kings. King Jeroboam knows that the, the Assyrians are about to attack, or Syria is about to attack, and he's afraid, and God sends the prophet to him and says, I want you to do a couple of prophetic things because I want you to hear from God, and by what you do and how you respond to the prophetic is, is going to either allow God to do more or cause God to do less. Oh, you need to get that one. Just because you get a prophetic word doesn't mean it's going to happen. Never has, never will. The only prophetic words that, are, that mankind had to have nothing to do with is the messianic prophetic words about Jesus. The rest of them. He was coming whether the world was ready or not. All it took was God finding one maiden that was right in the right time and the right place. The rest of the world didn't want him. What happened to King Herod when he found out about, let's go kill all the kids in that area two years or younger? Didn't want it. But you had one handmaiden that said, be it as you have said. No matter what what repercussions are going to come on me, I want it done. She gave herself completely to God. Now we have a king that that doesn't do that. Let's, Let's pick up in verse 17. And so Elijah says to, to, to Jeroboam, he says, I want you to open the window, uh, open the window eastward, and he opened it, and Elisha said, shoot, and he, so he shot out an arrow. And he said, the arrow of, God, of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt might the Syrians and Ephek until, they are, until thou hast consumed them, and then he says, now take the arrows, and he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, beat upon the ground. I want you to take these arrows, and I want you to beat upon the ground. Not a hard thing to do, right? Okay, you've already opened the window. You shot out an arrow, and hopefully somebody wasn't in your back courtyard during <laughs> the east when you shot the thing out your window. But I want you to take these arrows, and I want you to beat them in the ground. How many know Elijah? Elisha didn't show up to make people do something if it wasn't significant. This was a prophetic word from God. But look what it says. It says here, and he smote thrice and stayed. He went, well, I'm just feeling really silly about this. I think I'm just going to stop right here. Only three times, and and it said he stayed. He refused to go any further. Verse 19, and the man of God was wroth with him. Well, he did what he said. If you have an army coming after you, and you have a prophet tell you to beat the ground with the arrows, beat the arrows until the place where they fall apart. Uh, Mary and I will both tell you there have been times God has told us to do things prophetically that seem to be some of the most stupid things in, in the flesh that we could have ever thought of to do. 
But by yielding to it and just simply going with it, God did something with it. Here this king stayed. Uh, I'm, I, after three times, no, I'm, I'm not doing it one more time. I, I, this feels stupid to me. Half-hearted. You don't do the things of God half-hearted. Jesus said that if you, if you look back, you're not worthy to pick up the cross and follow me. God is saying you're either in it, you're in it 100% or you're not in it at all. 50% for God is, is like being not in it. How many know what Jesus was committed 100% when he went to the cross? That's the level of commitment he's asking for us. Now listen to this. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou should have have smitten five or six times. Then th hadst thou smitten Syria until thou hast consumed them. But whereas now thou shalt smite them but thrice. In other words, if you would have done what I told you to do, there would have been nothing left. You would have consumed Syria. They would have never become a threat. But this time you're going to smite them thrice. They're going to come, they're going to regroup later on. How many know they came back and were a problem later on for Israel? Give yourself wholeheartedly with what God tells you. Sometimes you feel the anointing, sometimes you don't. It's not about the feeling, it's not about your feelings, it's about obedience. Obedience is always better than sacrifice. What got King Saul into trouble? He was worried about what the people thought instead of obedience to God. We have got to absolutely yield to what God wants to do and give it with all of our hearts. To walk in righteousness with all of our hearts. This is one thing God was emphatic about this morning. And this is, this is a counsel that God gave to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7 when Paul was writing to young minister Timothy. He said, Where have I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the, by the putting out of hands? We need to learn to stir up the gift of God that's in us. We need to learn to stir it up daily. Because what the enemy wants to do is to get you to relax, to get you to lose uh, lose momentum. He wants to try to take the wind out of your sails. But God has given you, every one of us and every one of us have a unique mechanism. It can be listening to praise and worship. It can be listening to preaching. Whatever it takes that stirs up that gift, that stirs up the anointing, you need to find out what it is because that's, that's going to be your lifesaver. It's like being a, in a, have you ever seen a kid, you know, they're playing with their little toy and it seems like the batteries last shorter and shorter? And the only way that to continue is you've got to put in a new battery. Stirring up the gift on the inside of you is what creates the, the, the power charge, the dynamo of the Holy Spirit within you. And each one of us, it is unique to our gifting and to our anointing. And as we find it, once you find what works, keep working it. When you get in, that's why when David, when he was in Ziklag, and, and he was to the place to where he wanted to give up, and his own men wanted to kill him, he did something that encouraged him in the Lord. The Bible just says he encouraged himself in the Lord. I'm sure he grabbed a heart and harp and begin to sing or begin to praise because that was who he was. But whatever it was, he did it and it began to give him strength. He said, you know what, I think I need to see God. God, do you want me to go take these boys down? Now he went from, I might as well just kill myself because my guys want to kill me and then I'm sitting here and I've cried until I've cried no more. He went from that within just a few moments to, Lord, you, I'm, I'm getting ready to open up a can of whoop Amalekites. Now, is this your will? Because I've, I've had about enough of this, and I'm going to go and I'm going to make sure this never happens again, and I'm going to get my stuff back, but I want to make sure that you're with me on this. He went, he went from one to the other because he encouraged himself in God. We need to stop wanting everybody else to encourage us. If you learn to encourage yourself, you'll be in a position to encourage somebody else. Now, I want you to notice a unique thing. The very next verse, everybody quotes without quoting the verse prior to this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind that is connected to stir up the gift. When you stir up the gift, f uh, fear loses its power. So when fear tries to take hold, your response is to stir up the gift. Stir up that anointing. Stir up who you really are in Christ. 
The whole world told David that he was just a little shepherd boy. He was the scrawniest of the lot and that he wouldn't get him out to anything. But on the inside of him was a giant killer. And you see, he didn't stop with Goliath. Later on in his administration, he hunted down his other brothers and killed them. He had four other brothers. That's the reason why he picked up five stones. Five is the number of grace, but he also knew that Goliath had four other brothers. He says, I got a stone with their name on every one of them. And before he died, he got the other four. The world saw a shepherd boy, but God looked on this little scrawny kid and said, he's a giant killer. What is the kingdom of God saying about you right now? Who are you really? It's not what the world says. It's not what your mama said about you. It's not what your friends say about you. It is what Almighty God has said about you. That is what counts. And we need to begin finding out what God has said about us and begin walking in who we really are because everything else is a lie. And the lie takes away your power. The lie puts you in passive mode. The lie keeps you in bondage. We're like the guys that have been hypnotized and, they, and, and they'll take, and I've seen where they've done hypnosis and they take these little paper chains and they tell the people that these are titanium unbreakable chains and they walk around and they can't break the paper. That's you when you have been separated from who you really are in Christ. So that's why the first stage of rebuilding is rebuilding you. Because every one of us, if I'm in covenant with Almighty God, I have the anointing to kill every giant in my life. If you're, if you're in the kingdom of God, you're in covenant with Almighty God, you have the giant killer on the inside of you that has the anointing of God, that all it takes is a couple of stones and a sling is all you need to kill your giants. The devil has convinced us that we are far, far less than what we are. Everything starts out spiritually. This is one of the reasons why we need to stir up that gift. You can't start in the flesh. You've got to start by doing things in the spirit. And so by stirring up that gift, it begins to stir up that authority. It begins to stir up power, love, and a sound mind on the inside of you that suppresses and displaces fear. As I was putting this together this morning, God showed me a river because I mean, the river of God is beginning to get ready to flow. Not with what a lot of people have called revival. I'm talking about the real thing, not some worked up thing. But God showed me people that begin to really get in line with him, that begin to flow and begin to make progress in the river. And then there were people sitting on the side of the river griping and complaining because God wasn't doing anything. Anybody ever know anybody like that? They're a melancholy personified. They are Eeyore sitting on the side of the river watching you go by saying, thanks for thinking about me. And what they want to do is they want to call you out of the river and make them their special project so that, that you, by your the attention that you give them, you're going to make them feel special. The time of special projects is over. Either they get in the river or they don't. Because if the, the, cause what they're going to do is they're going to pull you out of what God wants you to do to try to get them to do what they're supposed to do. That time's over. God is saying you, the only way that you can affect them is you get in the river and they begin to see the testimony of what I'm doing in your life and they begin to repent and change and jump in for themselves. What we're, what we're needing to do, we're, we're needing to, as, as I begin to walk with God and you begin to walk with God, God is going to give us an anointing to begin attracting kindred spirits in the kingdom. I'm done, I'm done trying to convince people who they are in Christ. I want to talk to people who know they are in Christ. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. I know the last, with me writing this one book, guys, one of the things I learned about this book that I just finished it wasn't even the content of the book. What blew me away is that in four and a half months, I wrote a book. Almost 500 pages, unless they change the way it's typeset and stuff. I, Mary, well, I'm, uh, Mary and I are just working, and it's just, it's just like God just gave us in a grace and anointing. Now, it was, at the same time, it was tiring. I, I had writer's weariness, and Mary had writer's proof weariness. But it's, it's like, thank God it's done. <laughs> but I look back, and now... 
writing a 20-page essay or a 20-page article is nothing. That's a day and a half's worth of work. What in my mind was impossible, I began working on, and God just gave a special grace. By the end of it, I looked at that thing, and I thought, baby, I think I better quit this thing. It's almost 500 pages. It's because the grace was there, and God, that, that gift was stirred up on the inside of me. Now I'm addicted to writing. I've got a lot of things I want to write about. But at the same time, there's some giants in my way. You know, I, I suffer mildly from dyslexia and some other things. Uh, there are some giants, and I've, I've got to go back, and all the times I did not pay attention in English in high school have come back to haunt me. And now I'm having to go ahead and, and learn what I, what I stared at the ceiling and ignored when I was in high school. Oh, if I could only go back. But I can't, so that's a giant. That thing's got to get killed. I've got to begin finding whatever is whatever the devil has tried to put to cripple me to where I cannot fulfill my destiny. It's time for me to take care of those things and to begin working on them. And I'm finding that God is beginning to, to bring in those of kindred spirit. As I was doing the research for the book, I ran across and watched a DVD by a guy named Rob Skiba, and I had... Briefly met him at one, one of Tom Horn's conferences, the first one he did down in Branson. I, I, said it, I, I said at the back of the classroom, I like doing that where nobody knows who I am, and I can just sit and quietly enjoy. And I thought Rob did a real good job. Well, since then, he did a book on the Nephilim, and I was trying to calculate, uh, uh, balancing out the Bible and the book of Enoch and trying to calculate when the Watchers should, or, or should have been released after their 70 generations. And so I, I rubbed and said, listen, these are the calculations I have done. Where, where are you at on this? Because these are some questions I got. We just kind of entered into a dialogue. And uh, come to find out, he, he's, he has uh, in all this research. He's also got into the, our Hebraic faith and an understanding of it. And so I send him some, some CDs, and he writes me back, and I have to chuckle, because he said, I started listening. He says, you're so much like me. It's just freaky. It's freaky. Well, see, that's kindred spirit. The Bible doesn't say iron and wood sharpen one another. It's iron and iron. It's, it's two hearts that are in the same place with God that are kindred spirits that we can sense in the spirit. And as they begin talking the word and sharing what God is doing, they begin sharpening one another. The, the, many times the ones the devil has brought into our lives dull the edge of your sword. They're talking unbelief while you're trying to talk faith. They're talking whatever is popular among, among candy-coated Christianity when you're trying to share the meat of the word and they constantly are dulling your sword or dulling your sword. We need to quit playing with that and we need to start gathering around people that talk the word just like we do. And if, I, if we start dealing with our giants and begin dealing with this thing so that we can begin to repair and rebuild to move forward, that kindred spirit will begin attracting others of the same spirit that are doing the same thing. You put two or three of those together, you can get something done. I think what God is doing is it's literally uh, David's mighty men are going to begin to be built and gathered together in the kingdom of God. As we, if we all start doing what we're supposed to be doing, we'll attract one another. How many of you ever met a Christian that you, know, you find they believe like you do, they're on fire like you are, and when you start talking to them about stuff, and I mean, guys... Christianity has gotten such weak need. I mean, not even dealing with our Hebraic heritage, just dealing with some good old Baptist stuff. I mean, I, 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 I've cut my teeth on Spurgeon and just talking about just some of the old fundamental doctrines. And Christians today act like that is some weird doctrine, and they, they can't wrap their heads around it. How Have you been aggravated like that? They try to answer everything with a sound bite. If you can answer a question about spiritual things in 30 seconds or less, you're not dealing with anything but a sound bite. Christians start opening up the Word and start researching and start talking things out and getting deeper into it. I remember years ago, when I, back when I was single and we were in, in the barracks and stuff, we'd get together and we'd start grabbing out books off the shelf and we'd start getting into the Word. It'd be two, three, four hours. And this was back before computers where you could just look up stuff. One guy was looking, looking at it you know, in, in the Jerusalem Bible. One guy was looking at it in the King James. One was, had his Strong's Concordance, and one had Matthew Henry open. And we start finding stuff and start sharing stuff. You'd get lost in the Word. 
And now we, we try to settle everything with a sound bite. Sound bites can send you to hell, or they can make your life like a living hell. And it's time to go ahead and get deep. Those same guys, if you, if you, you, they give you a sound bite with the word, but if you start talking about their favorite football team, they'll talk for hours. We know what idol you have in your life. Or their favorite TV program. They'll talk for hours about it, but they try to give you a sound bite on something that is their eternal destiny. Let's give the sound bites to the football teams and the baseball teams. Let's give the sound bites to your favorite TV show, and let's go ahead and give the bandwidth to talking about the things of God and let iron begin to sharpen iron in our lives. Well, Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to you void. And Father, right now, Father, I'll lose a fresh anointing, Father, in every one of our lives. And Father, not just an anointing, but a determination, because without determination, Father, we need to set our face like flint toward the things of God and toward seeing our lives restructured according to your word. Father, there have been so many blessings that the enemy has held back. And Father, I prophesy right now that those doors have got to be open and those blessings can no longer be held back. But Father, that they're going to be released in the name of Jesus. Father, I see that there was supposed to be growth in our lives. Father, as we take care care of these things, you're going to release anointing to bring us where we should have been if those stumbling blocks had not put in our way. And Father, I call for an dynamic growth and Father, dynamic change. And Father, give us the grace to flow with your change and not to fight against it. Father, let us enter into the flow of the river of God and the things of the kingdom of God. And Father, let us repair, let us rebuild, and let us expand this next season in the name of Jesus.